and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, we live in interesting times, which will be a repeated theme of what I will talk about tonight. Um, I figured I, uh, many of you in the audience are people who know me or have heard me speak before. It's nice to see you again. For those of you who don't know me, I thought I would introduce myself. Um, I'm a cell biologist. I work at Brown University, which is in, in Providence, Rhode Island. I work on the structure and function of biological membranes. Uh, a lot of my work is with the electron microscope, and we try to work on uh, uh, assemblies and channels in biological membranes. That's, in a sense, as a researcher, that's one of my jobs. Another of my jobs is that of a teacher. Um, I'm able to be here today because we're between semesters. My spring classes start on January 26. And in the fall, I teach an upper level course in cell and molecular biology. In the spring, I teach a freshman biology course, which is the largest single class at my university. How big is the class? That's not my class. Those are my teaching assistants. Um, <laughs> that'll give you some idea as to how big the class is. I also see, I'm very happy to see a large number of young people in the room. And I want to let all of you know, all the young people especially, that you may already know me and you may not like me. And the reason for that is if when you were in high school, you used any of these books for high school biology, I wrote them. So I apologize in advance for your experiences or for the backbreaking strain of carrying these guys around in your backpack. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on evolution and religion called Finding Darwin's God, which I expected to be a nice little book that would be tucked away um, on library shelves and pretty much forgotten, although I was sure it would make my mother very proud. Uh, to my absolute astonishment, this book is now in its 23rd printing uh, in paperback and has proven, uh, in the words of my editor at Harper, Harper Collins, to be a bit of a classic on the issue. And if you are interested in issues of evolution and religion, I'd very humbly suggest that you might find the book interesting. The subtitle is A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. Very often, when I go out and talk on this issue, I focus on religious aspects um, I'd be very happy to answer questions along those lines, but tonight I'm going to focus on the issue of intelligent design, especially as it relates or might relate to Ohio. As I said in the beginning, we live in interesting times. I think one way to think about that is to go back into what is now ancient history. In 1999, the Board of Education of the state of Kansas deleted all mention of evolution from the state science standards. They did that because they regarded evolution either as shaky science or as threatening to the personal beliefs of students uh, and their parents. Uh, what happened afterwards, I think, is, is remarkable. The voters of Kansas had about a year to think about this. Uh, and in the summer of 2000, they voted most of that board out of office and elected a new pro-science majority to the board. Well, as, as a responsive audience, if you're applauding for that, then you should probably boo for the elections in 2004. Um, and what happened that summer was that an anti-science or anti-evolution majority, majority of six to four, gained control of the Kansas board. Um, and uh, in a little bit, I will show you what they have been doing in the past, years to in the past year to science standards in Kansas. Um, I spent almost a week that summer in Kansas actually campaigning for pro-science candidates. I actually expect to do that this summer in Kansas. And the New York Times, when they wrote up this on the front page of the Week in Review, were kind enough to mention me, take a couple quotes from what I talked about, and also mention the title of my book. Um, what happened the next day was remarkable. Whatever you think about people who read the New York Times, they buy books. On Monday morning, a friend of mine called me up and said, have you looked at the bestseller list on Amazon? I said, no, why? He said, just look at it. My book was number 21 on the bestseller list, sandwiched directly between Clancy and Grisham. Uh, it was very exciting. <laughs> It only lasted 11 or 12 hours, but I enjoyed it very much. Um, and of course, for those of you who are interested, I have very helpfully placed the ISBN number up there on the slide. Um, one of the things that I have found in a history of from time to time, not always, but from time to time going around and debating people on the issue of evolution, which is after all what I expected might take place tonight, um, is that debaters on this issue claim to lead a purely scientific movement. And the pictures you see up here are from a debate in which I participated uh, about three years ago in Columbus in front of the Ohio Board of Education. And the topic at that time was whether intelligent design should be included in the curriculum of Ohio public schools. Now, one of the things that's striking about this is this purely scientific movement attracts an awful lot of support, which is not necessarily scientific. 
And I want to show you a picture that was taken outside the auditorium in Columbus on the way in. And this gentleman here was in the business of telling me and other people exactly where we would spend eternity if we were foolish enough to take the side of Charles Darwin. It's very clear that this is an issue that arouses very strong and very strongly felt religious feelings. And you might ask yourself, you know, why is that? Um, why, for example, is evolution under attack? Biology is a field that has many disciplines. And if you're going to take one thing out of the biology curriculum, why would you take out evolution? What's special about that? I mean, why not take out cell biology or physiology? Or for God's sakes, why not organic chemistry? Um, um, I can see we have the makings of a popular movement. And I apologize in advance for any chemists who might be in the audience. Um, it's a cheap shot. I realize that. Um, but what's the reason? The reason opponents of evolution will often say is because evolution is very shaky science, and we want to get the science right. But if you go to a website such as Answers in Genesis, which is the leading anti-evolution organization in the United States, you'll find a very different set of reasons. And I invite you to take a look at this graphic. Evolution is depicted as the foundation of lawlessness, homosexuality, pornography, and abortion. Not just that it's wrong, but it is the source of all of these bad things, whereas creationism is the source of a lot of good things. Now, if this is not graphic enough for you, I've got another one that I think will help. And this is also from Answers in Genesis. And I show this not because I want to make fun of it, but because I want to make a deadly serious point. And I like to show this to academic audiences, because academic audiences often think this really is an argue about sci argument about science. And they say, how about if we did this experiment? How about if we showed them this fossil? How about if we did this in the laboratory? Would that convince them? Well, take a look at this. If you regard evolution as the foundation of divorce, pornography, abortion, racism, and all this other bad stuff. Whether it's right or not, in the scientific sense, doesn't matter. Because it is the source of everything that is wrong and evil in society. And what I love about this is the founder of evolution, I can't read that name here, I'm sure you can, but it's not Darwin, um, it's somebody else. And if you portray, if you view evolution in this respect, of course you're going to oppose it, you're going to oppose it deeply. So how do you answer? How does science respond? I think there are a lot of ways to respond, and one way is to develop a proper understanding of science. Some of you may know that about four years ago, a county in Georgia thought that the new biology books they had bought for their students were so dangerous in terms of their treatment of evolution that they needed warning stickers on them. And I thought you might be interested. What textbook was so dangerous and so outrageous that it needed a warning sticker? So I figured I'd bring you a picture. There it is. <laughs> That's the book. And this is the warning sticker. And the warning sticker basically told students the book has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, on the origin of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully and critically considered. And when this sticker went on the book, I was called up by a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And she said, what do you think of the sticker on your books? And I had talked to enough reporters to realize that she was trolling for a quote. She wanted to write an article that said, author outraged, or author slams bored, or just something like that, so they could say that a Northeastern liberal Ivy League author was outraged at what Cobb County was doing with his books. And I decided I have a little fun. And I said, no, oh, I like the sticker. She said, you do? I, think, I said, I think the stickers are great. They just don't go far enough. <laughs> and in just a second, I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now, as it turns out, our president has tried to be helpful on this particular point. <laughs> And many of you may know that President Bush was asked about this, and he said, I think students should be exposed to both sides of the issue, by which he meant evolution and also intelligent design. Um, and Time Magazine, when they wrote this up, absolutely incredibly, my co-author Joe Levine found this, they superimposed President Bush's face on our biology textbook, which has caused us absolutely no end of delight. Um, and I keep suggesting to the publisher, you know, maybe in the next edition, um, that's what we could use. <laughs> But I have been asked about what I think about President Bush's opinion on this issue. And I, I think my response probably should be that I, like all other scientists and educators, are delighted that the president has taken an, issue, an interest in science education. We, keep, we hope he continues to be interested in it. And we also hope very much that President Bush will listen to his science advisor, John Marburger, who's a fine scientist um, and was picked by President Bush to give him advice on science. 
Um, he was asked by Russell Durbin from Ohio State University what he thought about evolution. And Dr. Marburger said evolution is the cornerstone of modern biology. And he pointed out an awful lot of work that we do at NIH depends upon evolution. And then he was very quick to say that President Bush has supported large increases for NIH funding. Um, and he was also asked at the National Association of Science Writers, he said, look, intelligent design is not a scientific theory. And as if to ram the point home, he continued, I don't regard intelligent design as a scientific topic. And again, I think if the president listens to his science advisor, he'll be in very good shape. What about, what about those warning stickers, the ones that I liked uh, so much? Uh, one of my former students, Colin Purrington, who's now at Swarthmore College, was so taken by this wonderful idea of warning stickers that Colin figured, you know, why stop with biology books? We could go a little bit further than that. Um, here, for example, is one that we might use on an earth science book, uh, pointing out that a lot of people think that the earth couldn't possibly be four billion years old. You ought to be careful about that. Um, and why stop with earth science? Um, we could go on to geography, <laughs> the earth is round. And then finally, my favorite, because I've always been suspicious of physics. Uh, with all due respect to Dr. Krauss, who's in the audience tonight, you physicists have some very strange ideas. Um, for example, a physics explanation material on gravity. It's worth pointing out that gravity is a theory, not a fact, regarding a force that no one has ever seen. Think about that when you think about the approach, the approach of gravity. Um, but what happened? in Georgia was that a group of six parents recognized that these stickers were in fact an attempt to promote a particular religious point of view. And they filed a lawsuit in federal court. The lead plaintiff was a guy named Jeff Selman. Jeff is the little guy here uh, being lectured by a Board of Education member in this picture. Uh, Jeff was able to prevail in federal court and the court basically asked that these stickers, ordered that these stickers be taken out. This is Jeff and his attorney very happy afterwards. Because I had testified in the trial, the Associated Press asked me for comments afterwards, and like a fool, I answered my phone and I gave them some comments, and as a result, my name was in the first sentence of the story on this that appeared in about 1,100 newspapers. The next morning, I got more, you're gonna burn in hell, email than you can possibly imagine from all over the country, but I have to say that it was far outweighed by a lot of congratulatory email as well. So let me get back to this case and to the sticker in particular. Um, I said I like this sticker, and I do in a sense, it just doesn't go far enough. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, yes, the book does have material on evolution, but a biology book has material on a lot of topics. Why single out evolution? Evolution is a theory. It certainly is. We actually have a chapter entitled Evolutionary Theory, so I agree it's a theory. But when you say it's a theory, not a fact, it makes it sound like theories and facts are opposite things, as if we're really sure of facts and we're not so sure of theories. In fact, theory in science is a higher level of understanding in, than facts, because what theories do is they explain facts, they unite them. And I pointed out to this reporter, if you went to the University of Georgia and you studied atomic physics, you would take a course in atomic theory. There's no time in the future when the professor is going to change the name of that course to atomic fact, because that's not what atomic theory is about. Atomic theory is a system of explanations that explains thousands, tens of thousands of facts about the nature of matter. And that's what evolutionary theory is like, too. But when you get right down to it, the sentence that bothered me the most is actually the third one. And the reporter said, what do you mean? You don't like open-mindedness or critical? I said, no, that's not it at all. Do you know what that third sentence says to a 14-year-old? That third sentence says, we are certain of every single thing in this book except evolution. So apparently, you don't need an open mind to study biochemistry. We don't have to critically consider ecology or cell biology or human physiology. And in reality, if I got a chance to rewrite the sticker, I'd rewrite it like this. This textbook has material on science. Science is built around theories which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. That's the appropriate emphasis, and that's the sticker that I'd like to see. <laughs> Bottom line. Singling out evolution or any subject for special treatment is very bad science education and also is legally dangerous. And the reason it's legally dangerous is because it naturally leads one to say, why? Why are you singling out one topic for special consideration? And if that reason turns out to be constitutionally prohibited, you might be in difficult straits. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, you all know this didn't end down in Georgia. Uh, the next migration of this controversy was to Dover, Pennsylvania, 
where the Board of Education, a little more than a year ago, decided that they would like to teach something called intelligent design. They ordered their biology teachers to prepare an intelligent design curriculum. The teachers refused, and they cited a provision of the Pennsylvania Teacher Code of Ethics in which the teachers had to promise in that state that they would never knowingly present false information to a student. And they told their superintendent, this is false information. We can't violate our oaths. What the board then did was to order its superintendent and assistant superintendent to go into classes and to read a one-minute statement about intelligent design to students. That led a number of parents to complain about this, and before long there was a federal lawsuit. That lawsuit was tried this fall from September to late October. Uh, there were a number of people on both sides of the issue. This is Robert Pennock, who's a philosopher of science from Michigan State, um, and I uh, was honored by being the lead witness for the plaintiffs in the case. I spent about a day and a half on the stand. I had a very good time. Um, then, as you all know, the trial eventually was decided. Now, there's a couple of funny things I have to tell you about this. Um, I didn't expect my cross-examination to go on for two days, um, and I expected to be back at Brown on Tuesday to teach a class. When I realized I couldn't, I had to do something I've never done in 26 years of college teaching, and that was to cancel a lecture class. So I got in touch with my TAs, and I said, I gotta cancel a class on Tuesday, here's why. And they said, okay. Um, and then I put a link to the article in Science about the trial on my course's website, so you know, the students would know I was not off you know, skiing or something like that. Um, and they thought that was okay. Then I put a link into the New York Times, and I guess they thought that okay, but they weren't, they weren't particularly impressed. What impressed the, the kids in my class was that week, there was a report on the trial in what is for college students in the United States, the ultimate news source. And I'm sure all the college students in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and that was <laughs> the, Daily, the Daily Show by John Stewart. And when John Stewart talked about the trial in Dover, that was the point at which the students I decided I was really doing something useful. Because if the Daily Show is talking about it, then it's, it's happening. Um, I'm sure many of you may know that the Dover voters, in one sense or another, uh, took care of this themselves. Uh, democracy works. Um, and before the court case was decided, before the court case was decided, they voted the entire Board of Education. Uh, all eight members up for re-election were voted out of office. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a marvelous testament to the fact that uh, people can understand the issues and when they understand the issues, they go out and they make intelligent choices. And I should also point out that this was actually, in many respects, was difficult for voters in Dover to do. This is a town that typically votes 75% Republican. The school board was all Republican. Almost all of the insurgent candidates were registered Republicans. To be sure they got in the ballot in November, they had to switch parties to the Democratic side so they could file as a single slate. And then they had to convince people, yes, we know that you're Republican, we are Republican, we are conservatives too, but we want you to go to the Democratic side and pull the lever for us. And lo and behold, they did. So it was remarkable stuff. Um, while this was going on, the legal system worked as well. Um, and at the end of the trial, uh, the federal judge who uh, rendered this verdict, uh, John Jones, uh, basically ruled that intelligent design was unconstitutional. His verdict was sweeping, and that is he not only uh, ruled on the narrow issue of whether this was appropriate, he ruled on the broader issue of whether intelligent design was actually a legitimate scientific idea that belonged in the classroom at all. Um, these are some pictures that were taken from the ruling. These are some of the winning plaintiffs. The case has the name Kitz Miller et al., based on Tammy Kitz Miller here, who was the first lead plaintiff. And I would invite any of you who are interested in this decision to read it. It's very readable. In fact, parts of it, as I will show you, are very funny. Um, and if you just do Kitz, K-I-T-Z Miller, on Google, you will find it right away on the web and it's floating around. This is Judge Jones. One of the things I got a kick out of was the insistence uh, by some people who didn't like the verdict that Judge Jones was another one of those darn liberal activist judges. Um, this is a cartoon talking about this exact point. Um, I'll blow this up a little bit. Um, and this is the sort of thing we have to appoint more church-going Republican judges. And this person who presumably knows Judge Jones says, uh, by the way, he is a Bush-appointed church-going Republican judge. Uh, judge, uh, judge Jones is a political protege of former Governor Tom Ridge of the state of Pennsylvania. And Judge Jones was recommended for the federal bench by Senator Rick Santorum in Pennsylvania. So any notion, any notion that Judge Jones is a liberal activist judge is belied by who his sponsors were and also by his judicial record. He simply, I am convinced, someone who is bright, who is intelligence, and who understands the meaning of the Constitution. 
and just like a good umpire who calls them like he sees them. Um, and that's exactly what happened in this case. Um, this is a nationwide issue. I've talked about trials in Georgia and Pennsylvania. I'm sure all of you are familiar that this has been an issue in the state of Ohio. It is also a continuing issue, as we shall see, in the state of Kansas. And I just very quickly colored in a few more states in which there are either boards of education that are trying to de-emphasize evolution or bills filed in state legislature to give equal time to intelligent design theory, criticisms of evolution, or even creation science. Many of my friends up in the Northeast tend to say, oh, this is just a problem in flyover country. Who cares about this? I actually spoke at Harvard a couple of months ago. You aren't going to believe this. And somebody put their hand up and said, who cares what they teach kids in Alabama and Mississippi? Um, and I thought, wow, um, you know, realize how that sounds. Um, and then I realized I was at Harvard. And I pointed out that E.O. Wilson, the great evolutionary biologist at Harvard, grew up in Alabama. And the point is, does it matter what we teach kids in Alabama and Mississippi? For all we know, the next Stephen Jay Gould or E.O. Wilson is down there in Alabama and Mississippi, and you damn straight, it matters what we teach people in every classroom in this country. Let's go to Kansas. Advocates of so-called intelligent design scored, no question about it, a major victory in Kansas this year by attacking what they called naturalism in state standards. This may happen in Ohio, too, so I would urge you to be on guard about this. Now, what do I mean by naturalism? The Board of Education in Kansas, which is now governed by a six to four anti-evolution majority, held a series of hearings to which many scientists, including myself, were invited and to which we did not go. And the reason for that was because the three board members who presided over the hearings had already announced in advance that they were against evolution. And the hearings were, in our opinion, simply a political sham. Well, what happened afterwards is the board decided, first of all, that they would de-emphasize evolution. Secondly, that they would introduce so-called criticisms of evolution of the sort that you've seen in Ohio. But if you really want to know what is at risk from the anti-evolution movement, look at Kansas. And the reason for that is when the anti-evolution movement got control of the State Board of Education, what did they do? They rewrote the definition of science itself, not just biology not just evolution, science. All of a sudden, they're getting the chemists upset. They're getting the physicists upset. They're even getting the geologists, who paid no attention to anybody, upset <laughs> on this issue. Now, what do I mean by rewriting the definition of science? This was the definition of science in the Candace School Standards. Science is the human activity of seeking natural explanations for what we observe in the world around us. It seems to me like a straightforward, common sense, easy to understand definition of science. Did the new board like that? Uh-uh. They deleted that, and they decided, we want to put this up. Science is a method of systematic uh, continuing investigation, uses all this good stuff, to lead to more adequate explanations of natural phenomena. That doesn't sound too bad, but wait a minute. What do they mean by more adequate as opposed to natural explanations? Remember the standards what sa once said, we seek natural explanations from science, and they now say we want more adequate explanations. Well, the board majority explained this to everybody, and they said, here's, the, here's what we want to do. We want to get rid of the concept of methodological naturalism that is used in physics and chemistry. Um, and basically, we think that what naturalism does is it limits inquiry and permissible explanations and promotes the philosophy of naturalism. In short, we want to open science up to non-naturalistic explanations. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. What is a non-naturalistic explanation? I can't think of anything except a supernatural explanation. Supernatural explanations may be correct. Remember, I live in New England. A lot of people who looked at the baseball playoffs in 2004 could, could see the hand of God in the success of the Red Sox. And you know what? I, I think that might be true. I think God might have had his fill of George Steinbrenner that year, um, and that was it. But that explanation, even if correct, is not science because it's not testable. And that's the point that is made. And the notion of promoting non-naturalistic explanations is exactly what's happened in Kansas. Now you might say, but you know, come on, shouldn't you teach both sides? Well, sure you should. But you have to realize that with many scientific ideas, when you talk about teaching both sides, what are we talking about? When we talk about both sides of chemistry, neurobiology, physics, or astronomy, when you look at the other side, you might be disturbed as to what the other side is. 
It could be alchemy, phrenology, outright magic, or astrology. Now, this is, uh, I, I think most of you will agree, even if you don't like what I'm saying right now, most of you will agree, that's a pretty funny cartoon, but it's, you know, it's an editorial, I mean, come on. This is an editorial cartoonist. He's taking license with the facts. Nobody really wants these things in the science classroom. And you know what? Until the Dover trial, I would have thought that too. But a funny thing happened at the Dover trial. Pay attention to this one down here. Um, and that is, where would intelligent design take the science classrooms? Michael Behe was placed on the stand under oath in the Dover trial. Michael is a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. He's probably the country's leading advocate of what he calls the biochemical challenge to evolution. He is very much in favor of intelligent design. He's a member of the Discovery Institute. He's been here in Ohio. On cross-examination, Dr. Behe admitted that his definition of theory was so broad, it would also include astrology. Um, and here's another thing from the same article. Um, he also pointed out, the lawyer pointed out, that astrology would come under this definition. Behe agreed with that, and the exchange prompted laughter from the court. Now, I wasn't in the courtroom that day, but I'm sure it was pretty funny to see an advocate for intelligent design say, yes, if you stretch the definition of science to include intelligent design, you know what else fits in that strike zone? Astrology. And I would add, so does mysticism, pyramid power, New Age spiritualism, and Wiccan teaching or witchcraft. Now, I'm sure this is all really fine stuff, but one of the things that it's not is science, and that's the point. And I think the relevant question that anyone who advocates intelligent design has to answer is you want to open the science classroom up to intelligent design, you will also open it to astrology and a whole host of pseudoscientific beliefs. Is this really what you want to do in, in terms of in, uh, reforming science teaching? And I should point out, this was not an accidental statement by Dr. B. He, he said it in his deposition. Then he said it in trial. The attorney asked him again, are you sure? Do you really mean that? And he went on and he said yes, and he thought astrology had made some very fundamental contributions to science. So in any event, um, that's where we are with this. Now, one of the th questions that I wanted to ask for, uh, in front of this audience tonight is whether or not we can learn anything from the Dover trial. Um, I I've only been in two trials in my life. Actually, I guess I've been in three because I served in a jury for another trial, but it's really different being on the witness stand and being cross-examined and seeing all these people there. And I have to say it was a very exhilarating experience. It was uh, not unlike a graduate seminar when you're surrounded by really sharp grad students who are gonna push you up against the wall and see if you really know the stuff. So what I wanna tell you basically in a sense is what I learned at the trial and I think what most of it can take away from. Here's the first thing that I saw at the trial. It's the reason for the title of my talk tonight. What we saw was the literal collapse of intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now let me try to explain to you what I mean by that. One of the first things that intelligent design argues is that it is necessary to explain what we see in the fossil record. That the fossil record is a problem of one sort for evolution. You might hear people say that the fossil record doesn't support evolution. Well the National Academy of Sciences only a few years ago basically said look, there are so many intermediate forms between all these species that it's often difficult to identify categorically where the transition occurs from one species to another. In other words, there's so many transitional forms we actually argue about this. Christine Janis, a friend of mine at Brown who's a paleontologist, um, I once asked Christine, you know, what about this uh, business of no transitional forms? And she said, are you kidding? I just came back from a meeting where there are 11 or 12 new fossils from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming were being introduced and almost fistfights broke out among the scientists arguing as to whether or not these fossils should be called mammal-like reptiles or reptile-like mammals. <laughs> if, people are, if paleontologists are willing to argue about that, it tells you two things. One is paleontologists will argue about anything. <laughs> and the second thing that it will tell you is that there are innumerable intermediate and transitional forms that we see in the fossil record. But I want to go a little bit further th than this. Um, one of the arguments that has often been made against evolution is that the fossil record doesn't have the intermediates that it ought to. For example, we've known for a long time that whales and dolphins evolved from terrestrial mammals. There are unmistakable marks in their genetics and in their skeleton of this. But critics of evolution have said, oh yeah? Well, you know, if they did, where are the intermediate forms? You know, put up or shut up. And in fact, I've even seen cartoons that looked a bit like this, ridiculing the notion that an intermediate could even exist 
between a land mammal and a swimming mammal, and the argument is that such animals would be so awkward on the land and so poor at swimming in the water that they really wouldn't be survivable. Well, the cartoons and the arguments started to disappear about 10 or 12 years ago when the very first skeletons of exactly such creatures were dug up. This is the skeleton of an organism which is now called Ambulocetus natans. And if your Latin is good, you'll know that Ambulocetus means the walking whale and natans means who swims. This is the walking whale who swims. It is a perfect intermediate form to plug right in the middle. So you might say, do we now have a true intermediate form? Not really. As it turns out, we have five intermediate forms that fill this gap, all discovered within the last two decades, precisely because paleontologists, when they found this guy, they figured out we know where to look. And where to look is in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan. That's where these creatures evolved, and that's where more intermediate fossils are found all the time. Okay, so do evolutionists say, yay, we've solved the problem, evolution is true, Darwin was right? No. Science is enormously self-critical. If this really happened, if this is a genuine evolutionary series, do you know what has to have happened along with it? The middle ear has to have been completely changed. And the reason for that is the middle ear that a land mammal, like us, has is very good for hearing in the air. If any of you have scuba dived or snorkeled, you know that your hearing stinks underwater. Your hearing is lousy. But the underwater hearing of these guys is sensational. It's so good they can use it as a form of sonar. That's because their middle ear structure is entirely different. So if this is real, we should be able to look at the middle ear structure of these fossils and see intermediate forms in which they're reshaped. And you know what? That's exactly what we see. This is a paper a year and a half ago from Nature dissecting a series of fossil skulls and showing exactly how the apparatus in the middle ear was remodeled through a whole series of intermediate forms to change from an apparatus that was good for hearing in the air to an apparatus that was intermediate to an apparatus that was terrific for hearing under the water. So the fossil record, the more we fill it in, the more complete it becomes and the more powerful it becomes as evidence for evolution. The second thing that you saw at the trial was that when data was introduced at the trial, which I and another witness introduced from whole genome sequencing, the intelligent design advocates just literally had nothing to say. We weren't asked questions in cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities, and in fact, there are. But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis. And they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? 
It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome two is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823 to 114,455,838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications, the telomeres that don't belong, and lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there, it's testable, it confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way, by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason, no rhyme. Presumably there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer, but you know what, I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us, and therefore I think this is authentic, and it tells us something about our ancestry. Third thing that was abundantly clear at the trial, these great icons of intelligent design, the things that are supposedly unevolvable, they've fallen apart. Example, specifically taken apart at the trial, the notion that the bacterial flagellum couldn't have been produced by evolution, or the blood clotting cascade, or the generation of biological information. I don't have time to talk about all three, but I'm going to show you two of them. Um, the notion that these complicated biochemical structures couldn't have been produced by evolution has been championed by Michael Behe. And Behe has an idea that he calls irreducible complexity. And he says, you can't evolve these things because they're irreducibly complex. Notice what he says. An irreducibly complex system can't be produced the way that evolution works, by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. These are multi-part systems. And he's basically telling you that the 30 or 40 proteins that are in here, they all have to be together or there's no function. And since natural selection does have to work gradually, I agree on that point, um, it can't produce 20, 25, 26 proteins knowing what will eventually happen because natural selection is blind, which is indeed absolutely true. So the poster child for intelligent design by any standard, it shows up so often, it really could be called the poster child, is in fact the bacterial flagellum. This was mentioned so often in the trial that the judge, uh, probably from fatigue, got a little sarcastic about it. One of the attorneys said, Your Honor, when we reconvene, we're going to talk again about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge at one point said, Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> the last expert witness for the Board of Education, a biochemist named Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, was called up to the stands to talk about this. And since Behe had talked about it, and the lawyers had talked about it, and they had argued about it, and I had talked about it, as I'm going to show you here for a second, Minich got up there, and he said he was going to talk about the bacterial flagellum, and the judge, uh, the judge deadpan, well, we've heard that before, and Minich turned to him, this is the best line of the trial, Minich turned to him and said, you know, Your Honor, I sort of feel like Zsa, Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. I know what to do, I just don't know how to make it exciting. Um, and uh, so I, I take my hat off to Scott. That was good. I like that. Um, so what, what is this argument about? Here, here's the argument in very simplified form. Um, if you have a complex, multi-part biochemical machine composed of many parts, its function, everyone agrees, can be favored by natural selection. But the argument is that evolution can't produce them because the individual parts have no function of their own. That's what irreducible complexity means. So natural selection can't make this, doesn't have any function. Can't make that, can't make that. Um, therefore, you can't evolve a structure like this. Now, how does evolution explain something like that? Well, ever since Darwin, we've had a very good explanation. Um, and that is these complicated machines, they don't arise from scratch. They arise from combinations of components that have different functions, functions of their own. And the components originate with functions of their own as well. Therefore, natural selection will work every step of the way. Now, that's not evidence. That's just an argument. But the beauty of this is we can now hold these two ideas up against each other. And we can say, who's right? 
if irreducible complexity is right, then the parts of these machines should be absolutely useless. But if evolution is right, we should be able to take these machines, look at their parts and discover, wow, they do other jobs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the bacterial flagellum. So if we start with the flagellum, here it is, and these drawings name the genes and the proteins in the flagellum, and we say, let's take away a whole bunch of the parts. How many? Um, not one, not five, not ten. Let's take 40 of its 50 parts away. Now watch very carefully, because I'm going to do that experiment right there. There it goes. The parts are all gone, and I have left ten parts that span the membrane. What are left behind are ten proteins in the base of the flagellum. Now if irreducible complexity is right, this should be absolutely functionless. It should have no function. But if you'll pardon the double negative, what is left behind is not non-functional. What is left behind is the type 3 secretory system, and it is fully functional. I know most of you in the room are going, of course, the type 3 secretory system. <laughs> the type 3 secretory system is a molecular syringe in which some of the nastiest protein uh, 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 bacteria on this planet produce toxic proteins, grab onto one of our cells, and inject those proteins into our cells. The bacterium that causes bubonic plague works this way. It's really nasty stuff. Well, guess what? The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. They don't produce movement. They're not a flagellum. But are they functional? They are fully functional. So remember that claim. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. This guy is missing 40 parts and it is perfectly functional. What that means, there's no other word for it, is that that statement is wrong. Now that's not an incidental statement. That is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument. And in this case, it turns out to be wrong. Now it's even wronger than that because it turns out that not only do these proteins make up the type 3 secretory apparatus, but almost every protein in the bacterial flagellum is strongly homologous to proteins that have other functions elsewhere in the cell. And what that means is when we look at this wonderful icon of intelligent design, a careful analysis of the flagellum actually matches evolutionary theory, namely the parts should have functions of their own and not the intelligent design prediction. And that's simply a fact. Now, intelligent design does no better when it talks about blood clotting. Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot, and many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and Intelligent Design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Now this is an argument made by Michael Behe, but it's also an argument that the Dover Board of Education wanted to present to their students. They got a copy, they got 60 copies, two classroom sets of this intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. Pandas and People makes the exact same claim, only when all the components are present does the system function properly, even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out that all of these proteins are, almost all of them are serine proteases, which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now taking one away, that's eh, kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. Okay, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish 
a genome that was sequenced just a couple years ago is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. It falls apart, and this is something else that showed up in the trial. Um, this is technical information, but it basically shows that Doolittle has worked out an evolutionary scheme for how all of the factors evolved from a single set of components that existed before blood clotting was evolved, and that leads to an evolutionary prediction. And the evolutionary prediction is shown over here and over here in another paper, and that is that the protein should have very specific relationships to each other, the different factors, and lo and behold, you can search the genomes of a host of organisms, and it does exactly that. The relationships match. So what this means with respect to blood clotting is claims that you need every component to be present for biological function. That's the claim. Those claims are false. The second thing is a testable pathway has been proposed. I showed it on the previous slide. Careful analysis of that pathway shows it fits the evolutionary prediction, and there's absolutely no scientific support at all for any suggestion that the pathway was produced in a single step of creation or design. And that's what I mean by the collapse of the intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now, the one thing that I haven't shown you, because here I'm just going to read you part of the judge's decision, was a similar demonstration on the evolution of the immune system. And Behe has written, and it's part of in Pandas, that Darwinian explanations of the evolution of the, the immune system are hopeless and doomed to failure. Well, he wrote that about 10 years ago. And it turns out, as I described in my testimony, a flurry of research has shown exactly how the gene shuffling system in the immune system did evolve. And the judge captured this perfectly in terms of what happened on trial. On cross-examination, Professor Behi was questioned about this claim that science would never find an evolutionary explanation for the immune system. He was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he ignored all this and simply insisted that it still wasn't sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was simply not good enough. And the, 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 if you want theater in the courtroom, what the lawyer did was held up the first paper, have you read it? He said, no, this is a paper on the evolution of the immune system. Here's the second paper, have you read that? Yeah, I read that one, uh, so forth and so on. And gradually, all 56 papers were piled up in front of the witnesses, a witness all nine books and all of these textbooks, and he simply said, it's evidence that is not good enough for me. I think that made a very strong impression on the judge that here was someone who, regardless of scientific credentials, was determined to ignore the empirical evidence rather than to go by it. The fourth thing that really happened on the trial was that evolution was exposed as a religious doctrine masquerading as science. And I bring this up because I think it is particularly relevant to Ohio. And many of you may think, wait a minute, this doesn't mention uh, religion, it's not really that way. But I want to bring all of you, uh, uh, bring to your attention the federal court test for uh, 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 the actions of a government that might or might not infringe on the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Establishment Clause. And the established precedent is something known as the Lemon Test. And it's a court case of Lemon versus somebody else. And it basically says whatever the government body does, the action has to have a legitimate secular purpose, it can't have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. And then finally, even if, it, even if it, all this is okay, it still must not result in the excessive entanglement of government and religion. So what the judge did was to apply the lemon test. This is the strictest test. This is the most lenient test. And it turns out he found that the actions of the Dover board failed all three prongs of the lemon test. They showed, for example, that there was no legitimate secular purpose in promoting the teaching of intelligent design. And, and why is this the case? Well, one of the things you might ask is, you know, if intelligent design is a religious idea, so what? What's wrong with introducing it in the science classroom? And this is part of the judge's decision that I think really bears, uh, uh, bears making note of. Introducing this as an idea into a science classroom, as he points out, it sets up what will be perceived by students as a God-friendly science, and that's intelligent design, one that explicitly mentions an intelligent designer, and the other science, evolution, that has no position. What I told the judge is I thought a false duality would be produced. It would tell students quite explicitly, choose God 
on the side of intelligent design or choose science on the side of evolution and reject God. And introducing such religious conflict into the classroom, the judge wrote, is very dangerous because it, it forces students to choose between God and science, not a choice that school should be forcing them. It, the last question that I was asked was related to this, and I pointed out to the court that the Lord has blessed me with two daughters. I brought both of my daughters up in my faith, and I also brought both of them up to love science. And one of them has actually become a biologist. The other one has become a teacher. Alas, a history teacher, but we don't speak of her. Um, <laughs> but the point that I wanted to make to the judge is that when my daughters were being educated, I not only wanted them to understand and, and, and adhere to our faith, but I also wanted them to love and understand science. And if they were ever placed in a classroom where they were told explicitly or implicitly, choose the religious theory on this side or the anti-religious theory on this side, choose between God and science, I, as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, would have been outraged at this false choice between religion and science being foisted upon them. And that, as far as I was concerned, was exactly the problem with the Dover policy in terms of introducing this idea into the science classroom. Now, the Dover board, of course, argued that their statement was not religious. And this is the four-paragraph statement that was read to students. And if you look at it quickly, um, I like to paraphrase this statement by saying, basically, uh, kids, we got to teach you evolution because the state says we have to. Um, then it says, evolution, we're going to teach you that, but it's pretty shaky. Um, and there's a lot of problems and gaps. There is this other really cool theory called intelligent design you will notice that there is no mention of any problems or any gaps in intelligent design. And by the way, we've got this really good textbook in there. Um, and then keep an open mind. Uh, talk about this with your families. And by the way, we have to give you a test at the end of the semester, and evolution will be on the test. And what that essentially does, and the judge certainly agreed, is to undermine evolution and to undermine it for the purpose of promoting intelligent design. Now, you might say, well, intelligent design is not religious. Um, I think it is. But you know what? You don't have to listen to me. And you don't have to listen to the expert witnesses for our side of the case. As the judge pointed out, you can listen to the expert witnesses on the other side of the case. Because it turns out, Dr. B, he said that it is implausible that the designer is a natural entity, so it must be supernatural. Uh, Dr. Minnick said that intelligent design requires the ground rules of science to be broadened, broadened so that supernatural forces can be considered. And Professor Stephen Fuller said that the project of ID is to change the ground rules of science to include the supernatural. Once again, don't take it from our side of the case. Take it from the other side of the case. ID is, in fact, inherently religious. Now, what does this have to do with Ohio, you might say? Because after all, we're not teaching intelligent design in Ohio. The lesson plans adopted by the Ohio Board of Education, they don't mention intelligent design. And Stephen Meyer, from the Discovery Institute, and this is a posting that Steve has on a website. Um, Stephen Meyer even came in front of the Ohio Board of Education, and he promoted not intelligent design, but a teach the controversy prom uh, promotion. Now, this sounds very good. It sounds very neutral. Uh, it seems to have nothing to do with creationism. So you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with creation or creationism? Well, look at the whole website, and look where Meyer actually posted this work. He posted it on creationdigest.com. And he clearly intended this as a friendly audience to review the news as to what he thinks is happening in Ohio. This is clearly a backdoor way to sneak this um, into the classroom. Consider, for example, that textbook, Pandas and People, which was purchased for the Dover School District. When you read Pandas and People, it doesn't sound like it is religious at all. Darwin is subject to intelligent design, doesn't give a natural thing. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency. It sounds pretty scientific. It turns out this is only the latest version. And pandas and people existed as an earlier draft. We didn't know this until the lawyers subpoenaed the publisher and asked for copies of the earlier versions of this book. And when we saw these earlier versions, we just about fell over. The earlier versions talk about the creation view. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent creator. And in fact, when you hold these two up next to each other, what you discover is incredible. There is paragraph after paragraph in the early and the later versions of the book that read essentially identical, except a global word processor has changed creator to designer, has changed creation to intelligent design. How do you make an intelligent design textbook? You take a creation 
textbook and changed the word create to the word design. And this was abundantly clear. Now Barbara Forrest, an expert in the history of this idea, got all of the earlier versions. And what she did was she graphed the numbers, the number of mentions of creationism and the number of mentions intelligent design in the earlier versions. And you will notice that something remarkable happened in 1987, which is the mention of creation dropped to almost zero, and the mention of intelligent design moved up to take its place. Now, I, I don't know what you conclude about this. We'll get to 1987 in just a second. But my first reaction when I saw all these older versions is, my god, didn't these people learn anything from the Nixon administration? Burn this stuff! <laughs> but it wasn't burned, and it's still around, and we know what's going on. Now, some of you may know what it was that happened in 1987. But for those of you who don't know, this is a timeline showing a, 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 you might say, a legal history of litigation regarding evolution in various courts. And what happened in 1987 is a Supreme Court decision known as Edwards versus Aguilard that identified creationism as a religious doctrine. Literally within a month of that decision, the drafts changed from creation and creationism to intelligent design and designer. Basically, there's no question that this was simply relabeling the old product with new pack packaging to make it palatable. And again, this is something else that came out remarkably so at the trial. And what the judge wrote is the plaintiffs meticulously presented, you had to be there to see this, several drafts, some of which were completed prior to and after the comport decisions, and three astonishing points emerge. One, definition of creation science is identical to the definition of intelligent design. Cognates of the word creation appeared about 150 times, were deliberately and systematically replaced with ID, and the changes occurred right after the Supreme Court said that creation science is religious. So the history of this was very straightforward. Um, the members of the, the judge also wrote, um, and this was an extraordinary thing to hear. I'm going to move my lapel pin down by my microphone so you can hear the audio clip in just a second. The judge says, you know, the citizens of the Dover board uh, of Dover were very poorly served by members of the board who voted for the ID policy. Here are two of them up here, former members of the board, now voted out of office. To me, it's remarkable to hear a federal judge talk this way. It is ironic that several of these individuals who so staunch and proudly touted their religious convictions in public would time and time again lie to cover their tracks and disguise the real purpose behind the ID policy. I don't know about you, but I didn't know federal judges talked like that. And I found that absolutely astonishing. Now there is at least one, sorry, there is at least one person who understood what the policy was all about. All of you know who that person is, and he called it exactly right. Here he is. in your area, don't turn to God. You just voted God out of your city. <laughs> Pat got it right. Um, <laughs> this really is a religious idea. And what's astonishing is to see Robertson saying exactly what this is all about. And once again, I think uh, uh, regardless of what you think of the Reverend Robertson, um, I think he was exactly right from his point of view that this was a religious question. Now, um, the question I think that all of you in Ohio have to consider is, is this critical analysis lesson plan that you now have in Ohio, is this really different from the Dover approach? And I've read opinion columns saying immediately, oh no, it's got nothing to do with it, it's entirely different, the Dover decision is not precedent, that's true, it's just a district court decision. But all of the information that I have talked about tonight was unearthed at the Dover trial and it's all available. After all, the Discovery Institute came here and told you, didn't they, that they do not want to teach intelligent design in public schools. That's just not their policy. Yeah, that's Stephen Meyer. He's the guy who said that. Stephen Meyer is the author of a book called How to Get Intelligent Design into Public School Curriculum. So if you hear him saying momentarily, no, we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools, I think the proper way to understand that is we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools yet. We'll figure out a way to do that. Um, and the lesson plans, of course, don't have anything to do with creationism or intelligent design, do they? Well, guess what? If you look very closely at those lesson plans, 
what you will discover is the topics for the five lesson plans. Of those five lesson plans, four of them come directly out of the Pandas and People book, the creationist book that was relabeled as an intelligent design textbook, and the fifth one comes directly from Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. These are also found in a whole series of other uh, intelligent design textbooks, including Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. And you might ask yourself, well, are any of these really intelligent design books? Go to the Discovery Institute website, and you will find that these are touted as the source books of intelligent design. And the judge realized that correctly, and he wrote something that I think applies directly to Ohio, and as, as I think worth thinking about. And that is, intelligent design's backers have sought to avoid the scientific scrutiny, which we have now determined that it cannot withstand, by advocating that the controversy, but not ID itself, should be taught. And what Judge Jones wrote was this tactic is at best disingenuous and at worst a canard. The goal of the intelligent design movement isn't to encourage critical thought, but to foment a revolution which would supplant evolutionary theory with ID. And that is part and parcel of the lesson plans now adopted in the state of Ohio. Um, people might say, well, let's be fair. Um, isn't the scientific community biased against intelligent design? Isn't it prejudiced? Doesn't it suppress it? Um, I think that idea under overlooks how often science deals with novel scientific claims. But what we expect people to do is to do real research to back up those claims, to submit them to peer review, to engage in the give and take of scientific argument, to win a scientific consensus, and eventually, if the evidence is on the side of these ideas, no matter how goofy they sound at first, and no matter how much the scientific community opposes them, they will eventually find their way into classroom and textbook. Now, intelligent design advocates like to say they've got a new scientific idea, too. And you know what? If they wanted to do this, I'd be thrilled. I'd say, see at the cell biology meetings, see at biochemistry, see at the earth science meetings. We'll have fun. We'll argue about this. And I'll show you that you're full of it. But you know what? Maybe you'll do the same thing to me. Maybe you'll come up with the experiments, with the evidence, with the analysis that will show you're right. And if you are right, in 10, 15, 20 years, we won't have to go to the school board and argue. You'll automatically be in classroom and textbook. But their idea of how the scientific process should work is not exactly like this. It is rather like this. And that is they would like a direct injection into classroom and textbook. And they'd like that injection with the aid of the political process, which is exactly why they've concentrated not on research. They don't produce any. Not on peer-reviewed publications and not on winning scientific consensus. What they have concentrated on is public relations and political pressure. You might also ask yourself, how many scientific organizations around the country have criticized these Ohio lesson plans? And a few of them are shown up here, including my own scientific society, the American Society for Cell Biology, um, a society that is resident to many, many Nobel laureates and one of the largest experimental societies in the United States. The source for all of this information, by the way, is a great organization called Americans United for Separation of Church and State. If any of you are interested in their activities, they have a very simple web address, AU for Americans United, AU.org. Um, these are the organizations lined up against the Ohio lesson plans for fairness, for balance, for equal time. I also have to show you the organizations that have lined up in favor of the lesson plan. Here they are. Um, and you can make your own decision as to whether or not this is a lesson plan in which you, as the people of the state of Ohio, should be proud. What is at stake? in this, and quite frankly, this is where I want to close. I think what is at stake literally is everything. Um, this is a cartoon, last panel of a cartoon, that a friend of mine sent me. And you can see there's a young man here. I assume he's a Hindu or Pakistani. He's in a science laboratory studying science. And you can see this as the creationists found unlikely support among students in China and India. And this young man is saying, oh, yes, America, we would like it very much if you would teach your students your children, religious dogma instead of science, we'd like their jobs. And I think uh, to, to, to pull absolutely no punches, what is at stake in this argument, in this debate, in this political struggle isn't whether students will learn evolution. I think that's small potatoes. Um, I don't think a generation of citizens will be harmed if they don't quite understand the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation. I think what is, what is difficult is to contemplate an America, a generation of Americans growing up with a wedge driven between them and science. 
And the intelligent design movement proposes to drive exactly that wedge, which is aimed to produce what they call a theistic science. If that happens, then something that all of us in this room have taken for granted during our lifetimes is going to change. And that something is that the United States is the worldwide leader in scientific research and technology. If we put that mantle down, and I think this movement has the potential to cause that to actually happen, a dozen nations around this world will eagerly pick it up, will take scientific leadership from us, and will never give it back. And that is what is at stake in Ohio and every one of the American states. Thank you very much for coming. Today.